greet everybody with greetings of peace for the Muslims in the audience. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For all others, welcome. I'm going to be uh, talking today on the subject of the big questions, but before I begin my talk, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Dr. Zakir Naik and the Islamic Research Foundation for inviting me to participate in this year's conference. I hope everybody understands the magnitude, the importance of the work that uh, Dr. Zakir Naik and the uh, IRF are, are doing. I will try in my own small part to contribute to the excellence of that work tonight. So, the first question everybody is probably asking themselves is, what does the title of this talk mean? What are the big questions? Well, the big questions are the questions that everybody, at some point in their lives, asks themselves. It does not matter whether you are atheist, agnostic, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, it does not matter. Everybody at some time in their lives asks themselves, who made me and why am I here? Now, I'm going to take these questions in order. I'm going to start with the question, who made me, or in a broader sense, who made us? I am then going to move on to the question, why are we here? What is the purpose of our existence? And then I am going to move on to the logical extension, the answer that follows even after those two questions. So that, let's begin with who made us. To begin with, let's start with how an atheist would answer that question. An atheist, if asked, who made you? will answer, well, nobody, nothing. We, as a creation, are the result of the Big Bang, which brought the universe into existence, and we are the result of evolution, which brought life into existence and the diversity of life as we know it. That is the atheist answer. But does that answer make sense? I would submit that it does not, and here is the evidence. To begin with, let's look at the Big Bang. First of all, let's understand that the Islamic religion does not have any problem with the Big Bang. Islamic religion does not deny that the Big Bang happened. The Islamic religion, however, teaches that the Big Bang was under the control of the Creator. Now, which makes more sense? for us to believe that it was a random event or that it was under the control of the Creator. To begin with, the Big Bang did not start with the explosion. The Big Bang started long before. Before the explosion, there was a primordial dust cloud, a dust cloud in the nothingness of space which drew together as a massive hyperdense core of mass and energy and it was that that exploded. So, where did this dust cloud come from? Where did the primordial dust, where did the energy come from for this explosion? If there is one thing we know from science, it is that we do not get something from nothing. In the explosion, it was the greatest explosion in the history of our universe. It blew everything outward to the universe as we have it today, which is expanding as we know it. And yet we are to believe that this supposedly random event resulted in the perfection of the universe as we know it, whereas any other explosion results in destruction and chaos, we are to believe that the Big Bang resulted in the perfection of the universe as we know it. This is an example where science contradicts science. What do I mean by that? If you are going to explain the universe on the basis of science, you cannot have science contradicting the science that explains the existence of the universe. In science, there is a general principle called entropy. 
Entropy is the principle that unless there is a greater control over a process, the process tends to chaos. Now let's put it into real world terms. It does not matter whether you are talking about your child's bedroom, the kitchen sink, your workplace, or a complex chemical reaction. If it is not under control, it generates into chaos. If your child does not clean up his room, if somebody does not control the dishes in the sink, if somebody does not control the chemical reaction, the result is going to be random and chaos. But we are to believe that the massive explosion of the Big Bang resulted in perfection and not chaos. This is an example where science contradicts science. In the same way, when the atheists explain our existence as living beings, they use the example of evolution, natural selection. First, there was a single cell organism. From the single cell organism evolved all of life as we know it. But you know, if there's one thing that we know from our lives, it is that if you look at something, you know where it came from. If you look at a painting, you know that there was a painter. If you look at a sculpture, you know that there was a sculptor. If you know, look at a building, you know that there was an architect and a construction company. And yet we are to look at creation and think that there is not a creator. This is the proposal. The proposal of the atheist is that we evolved by natural selection with the absence of a creator. But I have a question for those who put forward this theory. Natural selection can explain a lot of things. It can explain the diversity of species. It can explain the fossil record. It can explain where the dinosaurs came from and where they went to. But how can you explain where the soul came from? If you believe in the existence of a human soul, how can you explain this as having evolved? For that matter, how can you explain life as having evolved? And what do I mean by life? I mean the power that gives a body, once assembled, to live. We have reached a point in science where we can transplant virtually every organ of the body. We can make a Frankenstein if we so desire, but not all of the world's scientists over the history of mankind, if you brought them all together, cannot make them live. We cannot even make the wing of a gnat in the perfection that it has been made by our Creator. And we cannot give a body life. That is why, once dead, medicine is not able to revive a dead person, even when their organs are still functioning. So, the explanation that we developed from natural selection is another example where science contradicts science. We have the example of millions of years of evolution or natural selection, and the proposal is that everything in our existence, if we don't have some control over it to keep it in order, everything degenerates into chaos, except for the Big Bang and except for evolution. Those two things, just by themselves, they tended toward perfection. Well, there are some people who accept that explanation, but I submit to you that it is not of those who are enlightened, it is not of those who have open minds or open hearts who accept that explanation. The Arabs have a story that they like to tell. A Bedouin is traveling in the desert, he comes upon an oasis, and in the oasis, there is a perfect palace. Now there are no building materials around. He finds another nomad and he asks him, where did this palace come from? And the nomad said, oh, subhanAllah, glory to be our creator, you would not believe where it came from. First, the wind blew so hard that it shaped the rocks. 
into perfect cubes with square edges and it tumbled the rocks over the desert until they all fell together in the shape of this palace in perfect assortment and then the wind blew the dust with some you know hairs and fibers from you know from the trees into the cracks and brought the rain and that made the cement that the cemented it all together and then lightning strikes blasted the sand into sheets of glass and blew the sheets of glass into the windows and then the elements took wood from the far corners of the earth and shaped it with the wind and the different force of the elements into furniture and into window trim and doors and tornadoes and hurricanes carry it here and drop the doors into the door places, drop the windows and made the window frames, tumbled the furniture into the rooms. These strong winds took the fibers out of the backs of our sheep, wove them together into tapestries and carpets, and coated the floors with it. And all of this happened just in this one place on earth to make this perfect palace. You know, when we begin thinking about it, we cannot help but roll our eyes and realize, come on, this guy is, is crazy. This is impossible. And yet what we are told to believe is that the Big Bang and natural selection through the two most climactic events in the history of creation accomplished something even greater than this. Let's move on. Why are we here? If we agree that as we are creation, there is a creator, we have to ask the question, why? For what purpose were we created? I ask everybody to look around, not just now, but for the rest of the night. Look around. Everything that you see that we have ever made with the hands of man, we have made for a purpose. What is that purpose? Why have we ever made anything, anything small or anything big? As far as I'm concerned, and I've never found anybody to say otherwise, we have never created, we have never made anything except to perform a function for us. In other words, we have never made anything except to serve us. Does it not make sense then that our Creator made us to serve Him? In fact, this is what Allah tells us in the Holy Quran. When he revealed in the translation of the meaning of the Quran, Surah 51, Ayat 56, quote, And I, God, have not created jinn and men except that they should serve, and some translate worship, me, meaning Almighty God Allah. So that is the purpose of our creation. That is reason for our existence. We were not created in the same way that we do not make anything except for it to serve us by performing a function in the same way we were not created except for a purpose. And that purpose is to serve the Creator, to serve and worship the Creator. So how? How do we serve Him? Think about this. Our Creator gave everything a guidance system. We have light to find our way during the day. We have the stars and the moon to find our way at night. This is for seeing animals. Birds migrate by polarized light. That is how they are able to migrate even when there are clouds covering the sky. They can read the polarization of the light even though they cannot see the sun. Other animals migrate by reading the magnetic field of the earth. Whales, lobsters, can actually sense the magnetism of the earth and follow it, and that is how they find their way. That was the gift of our Creator to them. Salmon, this delicious fish that we have, leave the place of their birth, go down the river, out into the ocean for years, for years. When they come back, they come back to the river they were born in. They fight their way back up to the river to the very spot where they hatched from an egg. And they find their way there by smell. 
They smell their way from the vastness of the ocean to the river they were born with, back to the exact spot they were born. Bats and river dolphins have sonar. Marine animals in the deep ocean, so deep that there is no light, they can read electrical currents so they can know where they are. They can find their prey by the electrical currents generated thereby. Insects have pheromones, which are chemicals so sensitive that they can sense a single molecule, a single molecule, and find their ways to food, find their ways to a mate. Plants, our creator gave plants a unique guidance, phototrophism, by which the stalk grows up, geotrophism, by which the roots go down and the two never get confused. You never find the roots growing up and the plant growing down. What is my point? My point is that our Creator has given everything in His creation guidance by which it can find its way to the things that it needs, food, a mate, etc. Can we possibly believe for one minute that our Creator would have so much mercy that he would give us guidance in all things, give guidance to all of his creation in all things, but he would not give us guidance to the hereafter? Is it possible to believe that? What would be the guidance to the hereafter? Obviously, revelation. Think of us. Think of our lives this way. A minute ago, I was talking about everything that we as man have made with our own hands. I drew the parallel that as we are creation of our Creator, we were created for a purpose. Now, when we make something, we make something with rules. It doesn't matter how simple or complex it is. If you have a spoon to eat with, that spoon has rules. You use it right side up, not upside down. You use the bowl of the spoon to eat with. You don't use the handle of the spoon to eat with. Now, this may seem simplistic, and you might say, well, I, I knew that. That's obvious. It wasn't always. When you were a baby, when you picked up that spoon, you might have picked it up by any end, and it might not have gone to your mouth. You could have put it into your eye if you wanted to, and as a baby, you wouldn't have known that that was not its purpose. But with the simple things, we grow to understand the rules. With the complex things, we don't. And so, the manufacturer gives us a user's manual. We buy a television, we buy a car, we buy a computer. What does it come with? An instruction manual. The instruction manual, by the way, is written by who? When we buy a product, do we ever find that Sony is writing the instructions for Panasonic television? Do we ever find that Ford Motor Company is writing the instruction manual for Hyundai cars? No. The instruction manual is always written by the one who made the product. That is the one who knows it best. So it only makes sense that the instruction manual for us would be written by the one who made us, the one who knows us best. To draw the parallel out a little bit longer, Think of any instruction manual you ever read. It starts with what? Warnings. Warning, warning, warning. What will happen if you use this product incorrectly? Then it tells you how to use it correctly and the benefit that you will gain by doing so. And it finishes with what? A troubleshooting guide. How is that different from Revelation? Revelation tells us what not to do and the consequences of that. It tells us what to do and the benefit to be gained thereby. And it gives us a troubleshooting guide. In other words, it tells us how to sort ourselves out if we have a problem, how to correct our deficiencies and guide ourselves aright. Now, if you meet the specifications of what your duties are, you will reap the reward. And if you are an employee, who is substandard, what happens to you? You get fired. 
Think about that word, fired. The consequence of underperforming, the consequence of not meeting standards. That word did not come from nowhere. In the past, the people who were developing the English language looked around and said, how should we describe somebody who is a failure? What happens to them? In the same way that a person who is a failure in life finds the fire in the hereafter, the employee who is a failure on his job gets fired. So let us not be failures in life and let us not be failures in the hereafter. So, hopefully by this point we have agreed that as we are creation, there is a creator. That as everything we make for the purpose of serving us, our creator made us to serve and worship him. We are then talking about how. The owner's manual, the manual of specification for us is the manual of revelation. Why? What is the need for revelation? Isn't it enough for all of us just to be good? Now, all of you know I am not dreaming up these questions by myself. All of you have heard other people asking these questions. Yeah, sure, I believe there's a God. Yeah, okay, I, I know I believe there's a God, and I know I should be serving and worshiping Him, but it's enough just to be good. I'm a good person, that's enough. So isn't that enough? The answer is no, it's not enough. Why? Well, to begin with, we have to examine the reason for revelation. Our Creator is fair and just. Our Creator is fair and just. When we die, we are going to the Day of Judgment where we are going to be evaluated and assigned either to punishment or to paradise. Would it be fair for that assignment to be arbitrary? We are going to stand in front of a court. Think about a court for a minute. To establish justice, you need four things. You need a judge, you need a court, you need witnesses, and you need a book of laws. If you do not have any of those four things, how can you establish justice? And on the day of judgment, the judge will be Allah, the book of laws will be the Holy Quran, and the witnesses will be the elements of creation, and the court will be the day of judgment. Now, it is by those four things that we will be measured. The angels who are in attendance with us from the day we are born until the day we die will bear witness. Our own hands will bear witness to what they have wrought. Our own tongues will say what has passed through it. We will bear witnesses against ourselves. The angels will bear witnesses as well. Other elements of creation who have witnessed our deeds will be there as well. And there will be no deed, large or small, that will be missed. Those will be our witnesses in the courtroom of the Day of Judgment. And we will be measured by what? By a book of laws. And we will be judged by who? By Allah. Now, if Allah did not have that book of laws, would he be establishing justice? No. If we were assigned a place in, in the hereafter without having a chance to guide ourselves aright in this life, then that would be injustice. The same as you, if you went to a court here and they, they either let you go or put you in prison based on nothing. As if the country had no laws. So how do you know what is right and what is wrong? Now, why else do we need revelation? Back to the question, isn't it enough just to be good? What is good? What is good? Good? is defined by our Creator, not by us. Go and gather a hundred different people together and ask them what is good to you, and you will get many different answers. 
Obviously, there are criminals out there. There are criminals out there who enjoy being criminals. They enjoy certain crimes. And for them, that is good. There are tyrannical leaders throughout history who have led their entire populations to destruction. Men like Pharaoh, military leaders who have led their people and their armies and their countries to destruction on the basis of misguidance because they set the rules for themselves instead of accepting the guidance of our Creator. Mankind cannot agree on social justice, economics, politics, laws. We cannot agree. So what is good if not what is defined by our Creator? It is interesting that it is in the field of religion that mankind presumes to write its own rules. How many people here, I want you to raise your hands, how many people here entered your job, walked up to your boss, and said, thank you for the job, but you know what? I'm going to write my own job description. I'm going to write the, my own rules. I am going to dictate to you what I'm going to do, and then you've got to pay me. I don't see any hands up. There's a reason for that. I asked my father this. My father is not a Muslim. May Allah guide him. I was talking to him and I said, Dad, imagine that when I was a child, imagine that I came home one day and I said to you, Dad, you know, I recognize your existence and I thank you for everything that you've done for me, but you know, I've decided to rewrite the rules of the household. From now on, we're going to do things my way, and you're going to like it. I said, now, Dad, what, what would you say to me if I did that? And he said, son, I'd tell you to go to hell. Think about it. Now, that is a very human response, but that is expected to be Allah's response. Those of us who presume to write our own religion, to set our own rules, to do what we feel we want to do, we are following nothing but our own desires. And that is not the example of the righteous, that is not the example of the pious throughout time. Why can't we worship God in our own way? Another big question that comes up. Why can't we worship God in our own way? I'll tell you why. I'm in India. I came from Saudi Arabia. I was born and raised in America. But you know what? There are places here where if I go and I eat a meal, they will not take my Saudi reals and they will not take my American dollars. Do you get the point? You have to pay with the currency that is accepted. Once again, you can't make your own rules. You have to pay with the currency that is accepted. If you are not paying with the currency that is accepted, you will be in default. Think about any laws that you have ever been subjected to, city, state, international. They have all been written by men. They have all been designed as guides. But over them all are the laws of God Almighty Allah. That is the guidebook for our lives, and that is what leads to paradise in the hereafter. Now, let's talk for a minute about this concept of the accepted currency. What is the accepted currency in terms of revelation? Well, if you are a believer in any of the monotheistic faiths, Judaism or Christianity or Islam, you follow the chain of prophethood to its conclusion. I can quote to you passages in the Old Testament which predict three prophets to follow. John the Baptist being the first, Jesus Christ being the second, and obviously pointing the way to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the third. I can then point to passages in the New Testament in which Jesus Christ alluded to the final prophet to follow. 
All of you who have been following Peace TV, who have been following the teachings of Dr. Zachary Knight, knows that he can ripple off the books and the verses in which the Hindu scriptures predict the final prophet, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now what have we discussed up until this point? Again, I may sound like a broken record going over these points, but I'd like to summarize. Inshallah, we have agreed that as we are creation, there is a creator over all things. Inshallah, we have agreed that the purpose in our life is to serve and worship him. And inshallah, we have agreed that the way in which we serve and worship him is to follow the book of his guidance, Revelation. What I am now going to take a minute to discuss is why we should consider Islam as the completion of that revelation. I'm going to start with what I know best, which is the monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So, let's take it out of faith. The Old Testament predicted three prophets to follow. John the Baptist was one. Jesus Christ was the second, leaving three minus two equals one. Now, we would expect that it makes sense that Jesus Christ, if there were a prophet to follow him, would have mentioned the fact, maybe not directly, but in some way. This takes us to John chapter 14, verses 16 through 17. In these verses, Jesus Christ speaks of his going away he says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth. Let's not read it in the translation. Let's read it in the manuscript from which it is translated. Notice I am being very careful with my words. I am not saying let's read it in the original. There is no original. Make no mistake about it. The Bible is translated from Koine Greek. Jesus Christ spoke Arabic. The authors of the Bible, who wrote the different books of the Bible, were writing in a language Jesus Christ did not speak. It is a translation. There is no such thing as the original Greek. But it's the best we have. Everybody who has ever done translation knows that when you make a translation, something gets lost in translation. But, as I said, it's the best we have. And what the passage says in Greek is allos parakletos. Allos meaning another, parakletos meaning paraclete. Now paraclete has been fought over. It has been argued about. What does paraclete mean? It has been translated helper, advocate, assistant, Holy Spirit, comforter. I'll tell you right now, in the phrase allos parakletos, it doesn't matter what parakletos means. The word that is important is allos, another. Why? Because in the first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus Christ is identified as a paraclete. Read it in the Greek. Don't read it in your translation. It states that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The word translated to advocate is paraclete. Now, what is the conclusion? The first epistle of John 2.1 tells us Jesus Christ was a paraclete. Then Jesus Christ tells us that at the end of his mission, following his mission, another paraclete, Allos Paracletos, will come. What is the obvious conclusion? Whatever Jesus Christ was, a prophet, he is telling of another to come, another prophet. Does it not make sense that when we are told in the Old Testament of three prophets to follow, when we find 
two of those prophets in the New Testament and the last of them speaking of the final prophet to come, does it not make sense to follow the chain of revelation to its conclusion, to embrace the final prophet predicted by the previous books of scripture, to acknowledge Muhammad, peace be upon him, as that prophet? I would mention, again, if you look in the New Testament, you only find this word, paraclete, mentioned five times. In these five times, it is mentioned that the one who will come will honor Jesus Christ, and he will be the spirit of truth. It's interesting to note that in the life of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even his enemies, even his enemies knew him by the title of Asadaq al amin the truthful, the honest. And Islam is the only religion, it's the only major world religion that honors Jesus Christ as he deserves to be honored, as a prophet of Allah. I am a doctor. We have a saying in the field of medicine. When you hear hoofbeats, think about horses. Don't think about zebras. When you see a lot of evidence suggesting that this person has a certain disease, a certain common ailment, don't go looking for the odd, strange, the rare things. When you hear hoofbeats behind you, think of horses, not zebras. There is an obvious conclusion to all of this. It is the conclusion that leads to paradise. And there are many ways of denying it. And every one of those ways of denying is a going astray. And every one of those paths of going astray lands you in the fire. Please, accept the obvious. Accept what is clear and model your lives around it. I was telling the story the other day of a time when I attended an ice sculpture festival. Now, many of you may not know this. It's kind of a hot country for ice sculptures, but in some countries, they have ice sculptures. We went in the winter to this vast array of ice sculpture. There was, there was one sculpture of a truck. You could see it with your eyes. It's a truck. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it has wheels, it has a hood, it has a steering wheel. Anybody can look at this and know that it's a truck. But the person who was with me opened their guidebook and said, you know, that's a locomotive, the head car for a train. And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, it says in the guidebook that this is a locomotive. And I said, use your eyes. It's a truck. We, we see these on the road how many times a day? This is a truck. They said, no, no, it says right here it's a locomotive. I argued, I walked them around it, I showed them all the features of a truck that a blind man could feel his way around and identify that this is a truck, but this person can see it with their own eyes. In the end, it just so happened that the sculptor walked by and saw us arguing about what this is, identified himself, and I said, okay, look, just, just settle the argument. Is it a locomotive or is it a truck? And he looked at us as if we were a little bit crazy, and he said, well, at first I said I was going to do a locomotive, so that's what they put in the book, but at the last minute I changed my mind, I made a truck. It doesn't stop there. The person who was with me said, you know, I still think it's a locomotive. Now, we are talking to the person who made it. We are talking to the person who made it and we can see with our eyes. Please, not for me, for yourselves, for your families, for the lineage that is going to follow in your wake, for your children, your grandchildren, and all who will follow, 
until the day of judgment, except what is clear in front of your eyes. The Holy Quran is revelation from Almighty God, Allah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was his final prophet. And if you have any doubt about this message, pray to God for guidance, pray to our Creator. Just use that term. Pray to our Creator with sincerity, asking Him to guide you to the religion of truth. Study. Watch Peace TV. Stay tuned to the channels that will broaden your mind and improve you and guide you to a good end. And I thank you very much for welcoming me here. That concludes my talk for tonight. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Lawrence Brown, for your very inspiring talk. Indeed, you raised those big questions. And speaking for myself and I hope for all of you, I think he did a great justice in answering them. So may Allah bless you and protect you and reward you, Dr. Lawrence Brown.